Not guilty, not guilty, ten Charles times. Charles Manson, described today by the star witness Jury again. The so-called Night Stalker case reached its verdict today. Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime the of murder. The woman suspected of shooting Selena is still holding police at the Music bay. producer Phil Spector was convicted In Monday. In Los Angeles, a killer the police are calling the Hillside Strangler. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, yes. Welcome back to LA Legal with Liana and Nima. And today we've got two more very special guests, and I'm going to let Nima introduce them. My good friends are here. First, we have Oliver Naimi of Citywide Law Group. His partner, Sherwin Arizani, not pictured, will be joining us as well. And we're talking about, seems like your favorite serial killer, <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer. Yes, I have a very weird and sick obsession with serial killers. Um, but that obsession only goes as far as like documentaries, okay? I'm not like. A weirdo, okay? Well, we know you're a foodie, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Nima. <laughs> All right, let's take it away. It is no secret that Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most notorious serial killers of all time. His life and murders have been depicted in various movies, TV shows, song lyrics, and most recently in the new crime, uh, excuse me, true crime series, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. As far as the lyrics, did you guys know that he made it into a Katy Perry song? I did not know what yes. song. And so there's a ton of backlash now because her lyrics, um, I think it's like Black Horse, Black black something, and it says something along the lines of, um, uh, she's a beast, she eats your heart out, uh, like Jeffrey Dahmer, something oh, wow. like that. Something along those lines. And so people were partying to it, loving it, and then now all of a sudden that they know what that actually means, everyone's like freaking out. It's all over TikTok. Well, it's interesting, right? Because, you know, the new Netflix documentary, really controversial for many reasons. I know Oliver has watched it. I want to get his insight. But, you know, I think the two biggest source of controversy were obviously they categorized it in the gay video yeah. or gay documentary or gay miniseries category. So they actually that, took that out now. Yeah, they took it out. But that pissed a lot of people off. I mean, obviously, Netflix is dealing with a lot of controversy. The other was apparently they kind of glamorized them a bit and they didn't really talk to the victims and really kind of get their input, the victims' families. I don't know what your thoughts were on the documentary. Well, first of all, I think that the biggest problem with it is that it does glamorize it. Uh, it brings light to serial killers and I think that not Jeffrey Dahmer maybe, but other serial killers or people that could be interested or, I don't know, be yeah, some, somehow interested in it would find that the fame they get along with it would make it somewhat more worthwhile. And so. Not just that, though, but when we're watching it, my husband and I, and he was like, this is so sick and twisted. Like, if you're a little not all there upstairs, this actually gives you ideas of, like, how this person kind of went about killing uh, and whatnot. And so... Uh, totally. I mean, obviously, we're a little bit older, and we've seen this terrible transition from serial killers, even though we're maybe we're dealing with one right now in Stockton, but to mass shooters, right? And we know that like copycat shootings are a real thing. And then to the extent that now you're kind of glamorizing these serial mm -hmm. killers of old, you know, who knows? There may be kind of copycats of that. And I think one of the bigger issues is, look, I get it. It's a documentary. Netflix is trying to get views. But in some small way, I think people feel bad for Dahmer because of his upbringing, his mom, um, his mental health issues. I mean, I mean, some people do. I certainly don't. You know yeah. me. I think everyone should rot. I mean, look, I feel bad to the extent that, like, this actually happens, right? There's people out there who should not be having kids, have kids, and they get all sorts of messed up. But do I feel bad for him because of, like, you know, he had a messed up family? No, there's a lot of people who come from messed up well, families. We don't, but don't you think there's some of the millions and millions of people I mean, that are he watching had, Monster he that had might feel bad for I think that Netflix so, definitely had that that portrayed in a lot of ways. Uh, there was a lot of blame being passed around. His father first blamed his uh, hernia uh, yeah. surgery, saying that's when he started to change. Then he tried to blame his mom, saying that, oh, his mom was on drugs when he was mm -hmm. born. And then he admits later on that he has some blame for it and that when he was a kid, he had certain uh, urges that were similar to Jeffrey's himself and he just didn't act on them. Right. So there's a lot that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure you guys are going to tell our audience what he did, but in large part, it supposedly stems from this, like, this abandonment issue, and obviously some of it's sexual and this sort of sick and twisted sexual fetish that he had, but, like, wanting to kind of keep these bodies and body parts were apparently part of mm -hmm. his 
serious issues with abandonment. Well, documentary aside, I was actually watching interviews with him, Jeffrey Dahmer, and his dad. Um, I think his dad sat down with Oprah, like, in 95 or something. And so he was saying, you know, looking back, right, you know, hindsight is 2020. So he's like, you know, looking back, he was about four years old when we discovered like a dead raccoon or something in, in, in their backyard. And he goes, he was so fascinated by the boat. I mean, when you think about these things, like what four year old is like, oh, that's a dead animal. I'm gonna play with the bones. Like, it's weird, you know? So yeah. I don't know if it's like, surgery or the hernia or whatnot. Like, this is something that's seriously wrong with this child who finds it who finds it appealing to pick up a dead animal and play with it and kick it around and play with bones. So I feel like there was something there already that was not right. Yeah, but dad was a chemist, right? Kind of right. encouraged some of this. Right. Well, there was, I read about a time where he was talking, they were having dinner and he was having chicken and asked his dad about getting, how he could bleach the bones and everything. Yeah. And then the dad sat down and showed him how to actually take the flesh off the bones and it was something that he used later on in life. Of mm -hmm. course, his dad didn't expect that to happen. But seriously, you would think something is going on. You have something you have to address right. rather than to help him with that. So that's a question for you as a parent, right? At what point do you just kind of think, okay, maybe my kid's just a little weird or like there's something maybe not right here, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question, right? We're dealing with it right now with the Oxford school shooter, right? Um, he shot up his school and parents gave him a gun for Christmas. Underage kid that had this obsession, right, with uh, violence and guns and, you know, he's looking up ammunition online. And Dahmer's family actually got sued by one of the victims, right? Because they said, listen, you're responsible, you're a parent, and, you know, you kind of knew that there was this monster and you didn't do anything. Now, obviously, he had like a broken family, you know, parents divorced. And a lot of this happened when he was living on his own or living with grandma. So the question really, like, how involved were the parents really i don't think that the parents were involved enough obviously but i also think that the times that the father tried to step in he sent a letter to the judge when he was being uh when he was uh being accused of some other crimes and he told the judge i think you're the last chance he has of getting better you've got to get him some help and they didn't do anything either mm -hmm. so it's not just the family although it is a big part the mother and the father but it's the system in general 100%. where people that are going in and aren't getting the help they need and then they're just being let out again and expected not to do the same thing again so what you're talking about is i think when he was um he tried to molest or i don't know what happened but um, the brother of one of the victims who he ultimately yes. ended up killing. So that's actually an interesting point. But I agree with you. And this is why I really like the story because you've got this like weird, like crazy killer, right? But you also have like law enforcement who royally messed up here, right? Sure. We have um, race that comes in. So there's just so many layers here that that's why I think this story is so fascinating and so interesting to talk yeah, about. Yeah, for those uh, who are watching who don't know, obviously we grew up with Dahmer, like, Maybe we could do a quick summary yeah. of, you know, I don't want to say his M.O., but some of the things that made him probably one of the most sick and twisted, craziest serial killers of our lifetime mm -hmm. and maybe American history. Yeah. So go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess it falls on me. So he, Jeffrey was, I mean, I guess considered one of the craziest as far as serial killers go he would go after minorities uh in the in wisconsin mostly and it was a lot he found out himself when he was younger that he was a homosexual and so he would go after marginalized communities uh such as the african-american community most of his uh victims were african-americans although he never admitted that he was going after minorities he said he would go after the people he was attracted to they did end up mostly being african-american and homosexual because he himself was a homosexual and he felt that he was a he had abandonment issues because his parents left him alone and one of the reasons that he always blamed for what he was doing is that he did not want the people that he loved or who he wanted around to leave him so he would try it wasn't about the killing for him apparently it was more about making sure that they don't leave him and he would try and create living zombies he would drill uh holes in the victim's heads and pour acid inside so that he could make, keep them alive longer rather than to continue killing other people. So his fascination, it sounds like to me, was not with the killing so much as maintaining control. And um, I think, I don't know, I think it's just a big part of 
this whole situation or what he had done is that he didn't he was a serial killer but i don't think it was about the killing for him yeah and he says as much but you know overall he kills 17 um uh, people one of them is 14 i think that's the youngest 14 years old um you know he uh decapitates them some of them he stored in his fridge uh one of them he kept the head and just put it in the bag took it to work with him uh, I mean, it's funny. You gotta check a, your bag. Do it no, not my bag. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe Noah's, yeah. but not yeah. mine. But you know, so the, and some of them he actually ate. Yeah. And so, try wrapping your mind around that, right? Well, yeah. Let's I mean, let's talk about it. So this is someone. This is ML, right? He drugs them, right? Usually some combination of drugs. Then strangles them. Usually, but not always. Sometimes blunt force trauma. Then they're dead. So. He usually has sex with the corpse, you know, for some period of time. Now, some of them, like Oliver said, you know, especially some of the later victims, he would try to drill holes and pour boiling water or acid just to somehow keep the corpse alive for longer. Then he dismembers the corpse and the pieces go everywhere, right? there. And he has a ritual. Like he makes, he watches The Exorcist and then he makes some of his victims watch it with him. I mean, this is yeah, like some... Yeah, The Exorcist. And he, Return of the Jedi. Yeah, and then he has like the the sleeping pills with the, with the you know, whatever. He mixes it in beer or yeah. whatnot, like waiting. And, and he recounts all of this too. Like during his interviews and his confession, he's like, yeah, I had it ready. I would bring them back and this is just what we did. By the way, speaking of TikTok, TikTok joke. One of the times he accidentally <laughs> he accidentally drugged himself. Did he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I saw yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he accidentally drinks. You know, it's one of those TikTok. You know, you know, I'm gonna be like a spot. He literally drugs himself. He wakes up, and the person who's gonna kill robs him. Like robbed him, and like took all the stuff from his apartment. Yeah, Three hundred bucks in <laughs> his yeah. watch. Let me yeah. ask you guys this, since we're kind of jokey, but. Okay, if you go to someone's house, right, and they give you something questionable, is it because we've seen so many of these situations happen that people like this day and age are more cautious? Or is it like, what is happening? You're going to some strange guy's house. It smells like crap, okay? And he just says, hey, my fish died. It's highly questionable. He hands you something that's like all bubbly and whatnot, and you're... Well, you mean, scared, right? You know, like, <laughs> I mean, like, like, a, a hitchhiker, say- right? One was the first was a hitchhiker. The other, other guys are getting paid 50 bucks to go to someone's house. So, See, the thing to me is that the questionable part's not the drink. It's the fact that they're going to his house and they're right, staying and there. Weird. But once you're given a drink at someone's house, I, I don't think that's the questionable part. I don't think they know that there's anything. And it's not like it's bubbling and you could tell there's something in it. He's just bringing a drink over. I don't know, you don't I'm expect just a it. I'm skeptic. I'm like, if, I, if I'm ever going to someone's house and everything about it is just creepy, I'm like, look. I'll be back. Bye. <laughs> yeah, there's one thing uh, about the sex that I want to kind of raise, and it goes, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it for the premeditation of the trial. So he's doing all this crazy stuff, but then he also wears a condom when he's having sex with the corpse. Does so, he really? Yeah, that was one of the, the pieces of evidence. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a, a premeditation. So well, um, and we didn't talk about the photos. He takes yeah. photos. Oh, of the them. Polaroids. Yeah, yeah. He takes mm-hmm. pictures of them, and he says later that this was his way of remembering them. So right? he's ahead of his time. Because he's taking selfies. You know? you <laughs> he go. couldn't well, keep I mean, the bodies, yeah. and so he wanted to take pictures to remember his victim. Well, that's part of why he was eating the victims too, or parts of the victim was that he was making them part of himself. He was kind of honoring them. He wasn't trying to. I don't know, cause them more pain than he needed to in that sense. But he wanted them to be remembered and be part of him. That's why he would eat them. Yeah. Wow. I mean, wow. Well, yeah. So um, lots of issues here. We talked about kind of um, the the controversy with Netflix putting in the gay category. Let's talk about the minority issue. We talked about 17 dead, nine of which were black, 14 of which were people of color. So he did target minorities as well. Right. I mean, he claims that he didn't, but everything points toward him actually doing so. Uh, although he did live in an area where the majority of people mm-hmm. were of color. So that does also affect his the people around him are more of color. Well, I also want to talk about the race issue as it pertains to law enforcement. Yes. Yeah. Right. Because I think that's a bigger issue here. Right. And so let's talk about the incident, right, where they completely dropped the ball. Lives I mean, could have been saved, yeah, but let's talk exactly. about it. Exactly. So, you know, it. specifically the 14-year-old, right, he is one of the victims who ends up having his brain or uh, skull drilled and uh, acid poured in. Uh, he somehow manages to escape. He escapes. You know, the neighbors see him. He's bleeding. He's obviously disoriented. He's naked. They call the cops. Cops show up and 
ultimately lead, they lead him back to Dahmer because he says, "Don't worry, this is just you know we were we're, we're a couple and um, you know we're fighting and he he's a little drunk and it's fine. I'll take care of him." And the cops take him back to his home and they're like, "Okay, you take care of him and bye." Yeah, by the way, he convinces them that this fourteen year old is nineteen apparently, yeah. like. And so, the, cops, and so, so like, the officers say, well, he looked 19. Okay, that's fine. Okay, maybe somebody looks older. But how do you drop the ball to that extent is is what I fail to understand, right? There, here you have somebody who's bleeding, who's naked. It, questionable circumstances. This guy's being weird. He's saying, we had an argument. Do you not at the very least ask for ID or like go investigate? They did none of that. Or well, they did like surface level. I think it's even worse than that. They had the neighbors complaining to the cops. Mm -hmm. They had to stop the cops and say, hey, this guy is not okay. Yeah. And they took him back. And either way, even if he's 19, 19, I don't think he's, he's not old enough to drink at 19. Right. Exactly. So that alone is one thing. The other is if they look... Well, the only reason I, that might not be true because in Wisconsin, I remember dealing with this with... Um, oh, is it different there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wisconsin might be one of those... 18 year old states. Uh, I'm not sure. I just remember we've had a lot of Wisconsin cases, Kyle Rittenhouse. It might be one of those. Because I know you can you can have certain types of guns in Wisconsin when you're 18. Okay. So maybe. Well, that uh, might. Yeah. I mean, I think regardless, it should spark some kind of a let's look into what's happening here versus, okay, just go back. You you boys have a good time now. You know, it. it, well, it uh, it goes even beyond that, though. Even if they had just checked his name, he was on probation for sexually molesting that same kid's brother at that time. So if they just looked up his name and saw it, they would have seen, okay, this is not right. Mm -hmm. And if they went into the house and looked in his bedroom, they would have seen other bodies in right. there. Right. So they really dropped the ball. Yeah, I mean, asshole cops that talk shit to the neighbors, to the firefighters that say, that, hey, let's examine this. So mm -hmm. um, really dropped the ball um, until... What, a year later, right? Another victim yeah. finally escapes, right? Right, yeah. right. So so, so the 14-year-old was actually not of African-American descent, right? He was Asian. So do you guys think that had he been white, there would have been a different investigation? They would have cared a little bit more? Oh, the original white privilege. You know, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I went Possibly. there. Possibly. What do you guys think? Right, maybe. because you have a neighbor who is, right, so Glenda Cleveland, she is, um, you know, she's the neighbor who's, who keeps calling. And by the way, it's interesting, and I like that Netflix did this, they played at the end of that specific episode, they played her actual 911 call. Yeah. And so she's calling the cops, she's like, look, something's not right, something's not right, I can't believe you guys let this poor boy back. And they're like, it's fine. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Stop calling. Stop harassing us. Right. So do you guys think that it's because she was black and they were just kind of like, look, stop, lady, leave us alone. Like, do you think all of these factors contributed or were these just like asshole cops who just did not care? Well, it's tough to know. I mean, you got to think that race possibly played an issue. There's got to be implicit bias. Let's not forget all the I mean, look, this is a lower income part of town. High crime. Right. A lot of neighbors are complaining about sounds. Hey, it sounds like a chainsaw is, you know, going on yeah. in apartment 213. It smells terrible, right? right. And he blames it on um, his freezer not working or some tropical fish. fish are dying. <laughs> I mean, but, but that's what how I'm big saying. Are those fish? Like, how, like, okay, I, I don't know. I've never had fish, so I don't know if they stink. But, like, at some point, is there nobody saying, like, look, these are enough complaints and these are pretty serious things that people are raising like it's not like oh the it, it just smells bad like this is like he's complaining about pork chops and like my my meat went bad like he's almost telling you that like there's no, no serious seriously drop the ball um yeah so let's transition yeah. to um so let's get sherwin in let's talk about i saw you waving i was just ignoring uh, you the, back there um <laughs> uh, dahmer's eventual capture and then prosecution all right let's do it. thanks for joining thank you for having me of course Welcome back to LA Legal. We're joined by all of his partner, Sherwin Arizani of Citywide Law, and we're going to talk about Dahmer's arrest, prosecution, and ultimate death. Yeah, let's do it. Take let's it away. It. This is your area of expertise. So, so obviously, Milwaukee police, they dropped the ball, right? Um, but as luck would have it, another one of Dahmer's victims escapes. And actually, he kind of played it really well to um, trick him into just basically letting his guard down for a few minutes. You know, he goes to the bathroom, this, that. He escapes. And then when, you know, law enforcement is contacted, um, they actually go to the apartment. So yeah, they take him back to the apartment. Yeah. And that's how he, the law yeah, enforcement yeah. finally go in. Yeah, they finally go in. So the victim, um, 
he describes a knife. The knife is there. When they go into Dahmer's bedroom to, they see the knife there, but really they see the Polaroids, right? right. And the Polaroids are selfies of Dahmer in that same apartment. So law enforcement can tell it's the scene of the crime with all these different body parts. Right, and then they try to arrest him. And then they find the head in the yeah, fridge. Yeah, they find the head, I mean, yeah. It's... Of course, the African-American head. In the yeah. F- you know, so things uh, fall apart pretty quickly for Dahmer. Right, and he gets arrested. So I want to hear your thoughts, right? Because we've all kind of talked about how we feel about him. But just really quickly, just so that we can bring you into this conversation, what are your thoughts on, on him? On him? Well, look, uh, I mean, obviously he's a, he's a sick guy um, in both definitions of the word sick. You know, he's... He's clearly got, you know, mental disturbances, but he's also just a sick bastard. Um, so it's hard to be sympathetic towards him at all. I mean, I don't think anybody wants him. I think that the show actually does a decent job of conveying that, um, you know, conveying that from the victim's perspective, even though it, I think, does a horrible job of conveying the, the victim's perspective mm-hmm. in general. Um, it does. You guys mentioned earlier that it does glorify him a little bit. I think it also makes people. It, it shows him from a very sympathetic angle. Talks about his childhood. Mm-hmm. Talks about you know where this could have came from. Shows that he has a mom and dad that worry about him, and you know they had some level of normalcy in their family and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you know it's one of those things where I'm old enough to remember you know that era, and it was scary and it was disgusting, and so. Um, this new generation, you know, it's a little concerning. You think maybe, you know, people that weren't, aren't old enough to remember it, they may feel a little more sympathy than, than we're prone to. So that's a little alarming. Yeah. I mean, it's a different time right now. I mean, you know, for instance, right now, Nicholas Cruz is on trial for the worst school shooting in U.S. history, right? The Parkland shooter. And obviously, look, his defense lawyers are doing their thing, but what they're arguing is, look, his mom was a prostitute, used every drug imaginable when he was in the room. He didn't really have a chance, you know? It's not like he turned bad. You know, one of his neighbors actually said he was never good. And I think that's not something I agree with, but I think that's the sort of the other side, the argument that they're presenting. Like Jeffrey Dahmer between his mom's, you know, just abandoning him, um, substance abuse issues. She obviously had mental health issues. There's multiple suicide attempts, apparently, that really... Dahmer never had a chance. And that was obviously one of the arguments that the defense raised during trial, that these weren't conscious decisions. This is someone that was acting Mm -hmm. because of a mental health issue, disease, whatever you want to call it, didn't know right from wrong. Right. And and before we talk about the trial, you know, one thing uh, that I remember from the show that really stood out to me, you know, there was a quick... uh, reference back to John Wayne Gacy, which, you know, a lot of people may not know who he is, but he was another serial killer. There were some parallels, you know, he would get some of his victims um, uh, drugged out before he, you know, he would kill them. Um, And, you know, in the show, it almost draws this distinction between them. And Dahmer himself says something in the show where, um, you know, he says, look, Gacy and and I are different. You know, he's now saying that he, you know, found jesus or found god or whatever but he's really not and then suddenly Dahmer gets baptized and mm-hmm. um you know then they should then they cut to john wayne gacy's last words which were you know for the lethal injection kiss my ass or some, something yeah. like that so it's like you know it, it, there's all this kind of subliminal stuff yeah. i feel like well those are the cycle of life for the serial killers troubled childhood some sort of weird like sexual fetish with their victims yeah. right yeah. you know some of they find god find jesus in prison and then you know, I mean, the way I see it, it's like, look, everyone's entitled to a defense attorney and they've got to say something. Right. So if unless you're going to say I, I did it, you need some kind of a defense. And then insanity almost becomes this like, well, he was just insane because no normal person would 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 commit these crimes. Well, yeah, and let's so, talk about us. So obviously, we're lawyers. So but we have a lot of non lawyers watching. Maybe you're not a criminal defense lawyer. So insanity presents itself a couple ways um, when you're dealing with a criminal trial. The first is what we call competence. Is the person sane at the time of the proceedings? And really what that means is can they assist with their own defense? Can they work with their lawyer, right? And if they're not, then they're temporarily held incompetent or until they can be restored to competency. Basically, so they can sit there during the trial. That's one. Obviously, that's not an issue in this case because by all accounts, Dahmer was like lucid, coherent. The guy went to Ohio State, you know, where my parents went for at least you know a semester or so or a yeah. quarter. Um, so that's not an issue. The second, though, is, you know, insanity 
at the time of the crime or the alleged crime, you know, and the way it presents there in Wisconsin is, you know, do you have a mental defect or disease? But really the real question is, does that disease prevent you from understanding right or wrong? And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what state you are, that's really kind of not guilty by reason of insanity. So the first one is a judge question. Generally, a judge decides whether you're competent or not. But the second is a jury question. Jury has to decide at the time of the crime, it's a question of fact. Did you but know right from wrong? he says it himself. Like, I knew what I was doing. I knew it was wrong, but I was doing it anyway, right? Well, so that, yeah. you have someone who's actually, okay, you guys got me. Here's my confession. And he tells them where all the bodies are, what he's done, how he's done it. And he's like, you know, his parents want him to plead insanity, but he's like, I'm not. Well, I mean, the, they, they, yeah. cha they changed the plea from what I remember mm -hmm. um, from guilty to not guilty by reason of insanity. And I think um, what they convinced themselves and kind of convinced him to go with and what he ultimately went with is that, yeah, I knew right from wrong um, somewhat, but I have this compulsion mm -hmm. where I can't stop myself no matter what. And in the moment during, you know, the acts, I would lose myself and I'd forget what I'm doing. I don't have, mem you know. Obviously, he was very drunk when he would do it. Yeah. Um, blackout drunk. He, did, you know, there's other evidence that he was. Yeah, blackout. we talked about that. We showed a serious alcohol problem. Right. This guy. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, but I think that's what they went with. But um, you know, ultimately, I know that didn't work. There's you. You talked about one thing. The the condom. Um, clearly, that shows premeditation. But you know, there's other things too. I mean, they. I think they, the way that he would organize the body parts, for yeah. example, the altar, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and the altar. Uh, the way he would target the victims, he'd go after. Uh, men that don't have automobiles because he knew that that's, you know, one way of tracing victims that are missing, you know, missing persons. So, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence, I think. And, um, you know, forensics, I think that was like a benchmark, you know, trial for, for forensics, really. Oh, yeah. From, uh, you know, in terms of expert witness testimony, psychologists, psychiatrists. I mean, some of the ones that I see testifying today really cut their teeth on Dahmer because, it was such a unique case. And you had defense experts, prosecution experts. You had court-appointed independent experts that really aren't on one side or the other. And it was really kind of this battle of the experts. Um, and the jurors had to kind of sort through all this. It wasn't a question of, um, you know, did he do it? It wasn't because obviously it was a full admission, right? He admitted yeah. to all of them, maybe except one he didn't remember. But yeah. he had really this, I think, 60 hours of detective interviews. He waived his right to a lawyer. I mean, he spilled the beans. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of, uh, did he know what it is? found all these bodies. Like, he yeah. told them where they were, right? I mean, all most of them were in such bad shape that it was just like bones at this point. Well, we know? talked about it, too, on, on the podcast. And it's like, could something like this happen? today and i've generally said no unless it's someone who's homeless unless it's someone who's like a prostitute someone that's like just under the radar because right now law enforcement techniques are so good look if you don't show up for one day i'm like blowing you up saying where is no. liana you know you, you mean, this is yeah. actually true i was not here last week i had something to do at home it's like are you coming in today i'm like we just talked about this no yeah it's not like people are gonna be missing for weeks or yeah. months um so obviously like he was preying on you know, like you said, people that were under the radar. Um, and that kind of goes to that racial, that economic, um, you know, kind of the sexual orientation, sexual orientation component yeah, too, you know? Um, but so it wasn't a question of that, but really, you know, you kind of have to get inside this guy's head and obviously not easy for a jury to do. And one thing, I mean, we talked about Wisconsin law, how it might be different from other states. Well, one way it's different in a very important way and people probably aren't talking about it as much as they should is, Wisconsin, for a not guilty by reason of insanity, just that very specific determination by a jury doesn't have to be unanimous. That's correct. So it's just need 10 out of 12. And California. That's, what, that's yeah. what they got, right? Yeah, that's exactly what they got. So literally there's two jurors that at least to question one, you know, is he mentally yeah. unwell? They said yes. So there's a real possibility that the jury may have hung, at least if it was in federal court in another state. Yeah. Which is a scary thought. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, talk to us a little bit about his sentencing, right? Because I think um, just from reading like comments and what people always find fascinating, and I did too before like, you know, law school and whatnot, is these multiple life sentences, right? So I, I get a lot of like comments and people message us and they're like, how does that work? Like, why are you getting a thousand years, right? Yeah. You're, you're, I mean, come on. So talk to us a little bit about why people get sentenced that way. And um, yeah, yeah, so I mean. It just happens that at the time, Wisconsin 
didn't have a death penalty. I'm not sure they do still. Ohio did not either. Obviously, one of the victims, the first victim was in Ohio. Ohio now does have a death penalty, but it's always the law that applies at the time. So no death penalty. You can't bring a death penalty case later. That's a violation of the ex post facto clause of the Constitution. So you have two states, no death penalty, but obviously, you know, premeditated murder, first degree murder, that's a life sentence. So judges can run them concurrently or they can run them consecutively. So obviously for a monster, and I use that term, not just because it's the Netflix title, but really is a monster. Yeah. A judge is going to run these sentences concurrently. I mean, this one just what a terrible, horrific way to kill someone. So you mean consecutive? I'm sorry, consecutively. Okay. Excuse me. Yeah, consecutive. I mean, they're going to be back to back to back. And then the reason you do that is, you know, just in case there's some issue on appeal, one of the you know verdicts gets overturned, you got those other consecutive sentences. So uh, he does get the what? Am I, 15 consecutive life sentences right. mm -hmm. in Wisconsin. Um, then they bring him to Ohio for that first murder, which he admitted to. In that case, he pleads. There's no insanity issue. He gets another life sentence, um, but all of it's going to be served uh, in Wisconsin State Prison. You know, and yeah. then... I mean, the only other thing, I think you touched on basically everything when it comes to the sentencing, um, the issue of how many years and all that. The, one other thing, I don't know if you'd agree, you're the expert here on this, but I think it sends a statement too, especially when you don't have a death penalty. You know, to give the guy 900 years... At least it says something, you know, it's it's really, you know, just kind of a symbol, if you will, of, you know, we're going to keep this guy, he's he's gone, he's not yeah. part of society forever and ever and ever, you know, yeah. so. I mean, that's the least they can do, right? Because now you have victims' families who are still alive and well that have to deal with this, and imagine the fear of having this guy on the loose somewhere. Um, you have the neighbors, right? All of these people whose lives he's impacted, even if they weren't the actual victims, right? So I, people in the community, I mean, I'd be terrified if there's some crazy guy running around like eating people of you course know? Yeah. So gay men in yeah. milwaukee were, were terrified of this guy and rightfully so um but i know uh, you know both of you you watched the documentary and they really kind of played a lot of those uh victim impact statements mm -hmm. right you know and also yeah. on court tv i mean it was those just... are always so powerful and last week we talked uh was it last whatever two weeks ago we talked about larry um nasser, nasser and you know, just watching victim impact videos for me is probably the worst part of the trial, oh, yeah. right? Because just, you know, in this situation, in Dahmer's case, like you have the family that's coming forward, right? And they've now sat through trial. They now know what you did to their son. Um, and so he it ate was, them. I yeah, mean. I mean, like, and some of them didn't even get enough body parts to bury their kids right so i mean I, that was probably like the hardest part for me and you can actually go online and watch the actual victim impact statements right because they have bits and pieces of the of the trial online on on youtube so it, it was really tough to watch yeah, yeah. Uh, um, do I? well I, I think they did a decent job of conveying those statements mm -hmm. but one thing that i read is that you know a lot of the victims uh family members are very unhappy with the show yeah um, yeah you know they mm -hmm. a lot of them said hey wh why didn't we even get asked to you know to give our input or you know sit been, we weren't given any notice this is going to happen um most notably to me it's uh the, one of the victim's sisters i forget her name now but but the one that you know was really just lost control um and understandably so i mean she, you know she uh she said you know i just was watching this and there i am you know someone's verbatim saying what i said in court and nobody asked me how i feel and it kind of mm -hmm. took them all back there which is really really sad you know yeah well we also kind of live in this era um where we are fascinated hey i am too admittedly right I, I love watching these things because it's just it's so interesting and and look netflix is just doing what it does best is they are creating content they're putting things out there to to bring in the the viewership and so I, i'm not fascinated by it at all um and i probably texted nima a few times this week, <laughs> like why why this subject you know but <laughs> Um, but I gotta say, I offered you guys this or uh, Johnny Depp. And yeah, 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 we, yeah. We, we, at least it's a break from yeah. uh, Johnny Depp. Uh, yeah, just too I much. think we're all tired of Johnny yeah, Depp yeah, at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. No, but uh, one thing I want to mention, I agree completely on the victims because you know when this type of thing happens, I mean they've suffered so much and then they're kind of re-victimized again. Um, so my heart goes out to them. I want to talk about another statement. The only talk about Dahmer's own statement at sentencing, really kind of chilling. If you haven't seen it, you gotta watch it. But it basically tells the judge like. He basically admits to everything. I'm a monster. And he says, I deserve no consideration. Doesn't make an excuse. Doesn't ask for any leniency. And that just really kind of went a long way. Like, he... And he wants the death penalty. He's like, yeah, he said, I deserve to die. Yeah, I mean, you make a good point. Um, but 
did you guys get the feeling that he also had no other play? Um, that really he just, you know, when, when you're that caught red-handed and you've already confessed and subsequently your lawyer convinces you to now plead insanity, um, what, you know, what are you going to do in that, at that point? You know, you're being judged for, for sentencing. You say, hey, you know, I did it. I'm, there's nothing I can say, no consideration. It's almost like, you know, it's kind of like the baptism thing as well. You know, it's almost like, you know, was he doing this because he really believed it or was he doing it because he's so calculated and, you know, he's maybe he's playing like three-dimensional chess in his mind or something like that? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, the reason I think maybe it was genuine and obviously we're fast forwarding a bit, right? So now he's in prison, right? He was in solitary for a while. Um, he says he wants to get out, be with the general population a bit. He comes out, he's shanked once, right? He survives. But he tells his dad, like, I'm ready to die. I deserve to die. And, you know, if it happens or when it happens, this is, and I don't know if it's a religious thing or, you know, I, I don't know. But um, ultimately, he does die in prison. And talking about another kind of controversy, again, um, I'm not saying that Jeffrey Dahmer deserves to live. He doesn't. But if your job is to protect you know, inmates in custody, and you let one of them get brutally attacked uh, in the shower. Have you done your job? And look, we've seen it again. You know, again, different, different case. But uh, we saw with Jeff Epstein, right? I mean, he's supposed to be under watch. Next thing you know, you know, he commits suicide. So a lot of controversy there as well. I feel like as an attorney, and maybe you guys feel the same way. I agree with that, and and I think about that, and I think about you know, did the system really do what it's supposed to do? As a human being, it's like inmates justice, you know, that I think we all, at least for me, I feel like, okay, he got yeah, what he deserved. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I feel like most people get justice in prison more so than they would sure. in the system. You yeah, know I mean, uh, like, that, that is street justice or prison justice. It's interesting, though, final thought, some of the victims were kind of divided. They actually wanted him to suffer in prison mm -hmm. for the rest of his life. So. Yeah. Well, I mean... That's a lot to chew on. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, <laughs> Nima. I was, uh, you know, How long have you been was, waiting I, for that I, I, one? I've been yeah. holding that in my pocket. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know? I'm sure he wrote it down somewhere. Yeah, and he was I'm, like, when is the right opportunity? I know. And when we're running out of time. Well, I'm like, I got to throw that out. I, I, I want to <laughs> throw in also, you mentioned your parents uh, in Ohio State. Uh, I went to Michigan. That that kind of thing, we don't condone in Michigan. Yeah, but course. Ohio State. Yeah, yeah. Different story. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, God, yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Buckeyes serial killers won. Uh, Michigan, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What hey, is it with you and, like, friends from other schools? Like, we just went through this on a different I know. I, I, I just like Make to sure call these the drivers. don't air back-to-back, -back, guys, okay? <laughs> on that note, let's wrap it up. Thank you so much, Sherwin, for joining. Thank this you for was so me. much fun. We love having you. Thank and you. Uh, hopefully you'll pick the topic next time and there's Sounds less good. gore. Yeah, I'm with that. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks so everyone. much thanks, for guys. tuning in, and we'll see you next time.